The time is the just time gone, is just... Uh, 20 minutes past 9 a.m. as we continue with News and Views this morning. And uh, this interview is coming to you live uh, on the airwaves of uh, Salah Media, on Al Ansar, on One Nation 88.9 FM. And also we're coming to you live on Facebook.com forward slash Salah Media. And uh, we are talking this morning with uh, Stephen McGowan, uh, who was the longest held surviving uh, or is still the longest held surviving Al Qaeda hostage. And uh, his captivity took place in Mali in 2011, his subsequent release in 2017. And uh, we're talking also about his books, uh, Six Years with Al Qaeda and His Reversion to Islam. Uh, and uh, we have also learned that uh, the name that uh, Stephen has chosen for himself is Lut. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to you, Stephen. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? You well? Yes, very well. In fact, wonderful, wonderful seeing you. And obviously, I was I was extremely excited when uh, my producer had informed me that I was going to be interviewing you. And uh, I certainly am looking forward to this interview. And I'm sure many of our listeners as well. Thank you. Al Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much for having me. Right now, you know, I just want to start off by saying that, you know, sometimes we don't realize it takes a single incident, a single event, uh, a single experience that can actually change a person's life forever. And uh, in your instance, from what I've just read and, uh, you know, uh, the purpose, uh, I mean, riding through uh, Africa on your motorbike and uh, not in your wildest dreams. Did you ever expect, you know, to be taken hostage, to be captured? But how did it actually impact it and change your life? It's crazy. You know, we, we all have these plans in our lives, you know, and God obviously guides us. Um, but it's amazing how, how actually we are not in control of our lives. And there is, you know, there is, there, there, there is Allah, you know, there's God. And, and basically he has his plan. And no matter how much we try and, and live life the way we want to live it, you know, there is a greater, pla a greater plan. And, um, and I certainly got to experience it firsthand. Um, and and uh, you know, like you say, this was this was a six year a six year changing moment, and um, my life changed. <laughs> I mean, it was once it was one sixth of my life, which basically I experienced up there with Al Qaeda in the desert in the Sahara. Yes. Now uh, let's just go back, and uh, you know, let's just go back to the time when obviously uh, you were captured, and uh, just to relive some of those moments or to share some of those experience. And if you could just take us through briefly, Stephen, as to what it actually happened. So I, I really, I was, I was living a dream of mine. You know, uh, I'm from Johannesburg, but but I spent a lot of time on a farm down in the down in the Eastern Free State. And it was there that I had this passion for the outdoors. And I always wished to ride a motorcycle through Africa. And, you know, I was, I was living in London for a number of years. And in, 2000, in 2011, I got to experience my dream. You know, I got to, I got to begin this, this dream of mine. And, and Kath, my wife, and I, we were, we were heading back to South Africa. And we were coming home. It was, it was incredibly exciting. We were coming home. I was changing careers and changing lives. And um, my wife decided to fly back and, and I thought that I would ride a motorcycle back. And it, it, it was, I, I wasn't far into my journey actually, you know, when, when, when everything changed and everything just spun out of control. Um, yeah, it was, it, it was, it was in, it was in, in November, 2011, 25th of November when, when, when really things changed absolutely. But I was, like I say, I was living my dream at the time, riding a bike through Africa. Yes. Now, obviously, when one looks at uh, the experience, obviously, it, it must have been a harrowing experience, uh, caught in the blue, in the middle of Africa, uh, in the heart of the African jungles. And uh, just uh, in terms of, you know, how, what was your reaction, you know, when you initially, when you were captured and you were taken? You know, Al Qaeda isn't really a word that we know of in South Africa all that much. And I mean, certain, certainly in the past, you know, when I was when I was a youngster, um, Al Qaeda flew the planes into the Twin Towers. And and that was obviously a huge event in Europe and in the US. But for us South Africans, it always was at a distance. So so for me, I mean, it was it was absolutely harrowing. I, I, I had no idea what was taking place at the time. Al Qaeda was a name. It was a word, but it was always a very distant word. And really, it was. You know, these guys walked into our complex where we were staying with their with their AK forty sevens. And what really struck home was was during this this whole this whole operation, like this whole armalia that they were doing, one of them turned to me and said to me, Do you know Al Qaeda? We are Al Qaeda. 
and that was then that really my world came crashing down around me and um and and all these crazy thoughts started to rush to my mind like what on earth am i getting myself into these guys are known for slitting throats and cutting off heads and um and now and now i'm basically in their captivity um it's funny how your life flashes before you and 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 your brain just operates at such a pace trying to make sense of the situation that you are now falling into but mm. really and that was day one exactly and i suppose you know uh, it uh, possibly you know it must have come as a shock but it's only after a period of time when the reality actually starts to hit home because you know uh, at uh, first you know the first few days it's shock and i've i've had obviously the opportunity of talking to a few other prisoners who have been kept up in places like Guantanamo Bay and it's only after a little while that uh, reality actually hits home and that's when you decide that you know i need to obviously make best of this worst situation that i find myself in steven 100% you know you know i had a british passport from living in the uk for so long and obviously the brits are are extremely hated by al qaeda you know for everything that they well well for everything that did, that, that that they're doing in the muslim lands you know in 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 um in afghanistan and in and 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 in like the arab peninsula so the americans the brits the french the israelis there are a lot of you know northern Northern Hemisphere countries that are absolutely hated uh, by Al Qaeda, and um, it did take months before I actually understood. You know, I was I feared my life enormously in those early months. It, there were some incredibly difficult and stressful times um, when I didn't actually think I was going to survive it. But and it probably took the better part of nine months for me to try and actually believe that this wasn't a dream. It was just so far from my reality, so far from South Africa, so far from the UK. It was just the behavior and, you know, it was absolutely everything. Even the language, I battled with the language, the food, the, the, the shelter, everything was just so far. And it took me months before I began to understand what I actually was in. And, um, yeah, with respect to, you know, fear, you, you, you obviously, I, well, I hit some very dark places um, where, where I was never quite sure if I was going to make it out of there. And I had a huge responsibility for my family. I was married. You know, I had a wife. I had, I had parents. I was, I was going to get into my family business. There were, there were, I had a lot of responsibilities. And I realized at, at a particular point that if things didn't change, I was not going to survive this. You know, and if, if, if I survived it physically, for example, if I wasn't, if, you know, if, if I wasn't executed, well, I certainly wasn't going to survive it mentally. And it was, it was there that you start to realize that, that you actually have to pull yourself together Otherwise, your life is going to change on a mental scale permanently. And you will probably, and I don't know if one can ever come back from a situation like that if you do hit rock bottom. Well, I'm uh, certain, you know, that, you know, all, a lot of these memories are still flashing through your mind. But the key issue here is in surviving, you've added value to your life. And I think this is important to understand where even you taught yourself a number of the other languages, for instance, French, uh, Arabic. And uh, this, I think, is very, very important because, uh, you know, once you start adding a bit of value, you try to make the best out of a bad situation. Uh, you know, a lot actually mentally or psychologically, uh, it, is, it, it is a boost. And uh, it actually, you know, you live with hope all the time that, you know, someday this entire ordeal will be ending, Stephen. For sure, no, for sure, for sure, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, I was, I really was thrown in the deep end, and and it, and and it was, you know, sink or swim. But I did, you know, I did. I learned, I learned, I learned about thirty-four of the Quranic prayers off by heart. Um, I, I learned it. I learned it, you know, like in Arabic, obviously. Um, a lot of a lot of the guys up in North Africa couldn't read or write. They, you know, like they were illiterate, and they and they didn't understand Arabic. Um, or, or you know. Or actually, Arabia Fusa. Okay, so they understood Arabia Hassaniya, which was the West African dialect. Um, but a lot of them didn't didn't actually understand. And and it added it added for for one probably the most important thing there in the desert was I really got to learn about myself and that I am far more capable than I give myself credit for. You know, if Al Qaeda weren't going to kill me, I wanted to come out of the desert a better person. And 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 it allowed me opportunity to learn how to live in other places. You know, in other environments. How do just 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 how how competent and strong are we physically and mentally? It certainly opened a lot of doors for myself, and also it required that I really leaned on God. You know, it mm. it really required I had nobody else on my team there. There was nobody else, and it re it really brought me very close to God while I was there in the desert. 
which was in emerging was in emerging as a better person, Stephen. What were the issues that actually stood out or stand out for you in terms of what made you a better person? It's funny. I did an interview a few days ago, and some people battled to understand when I actually came out and said that Al Qaeda had good character. Um, I, there were some people who phoned in afterwards and actually said, "How can this man say that Al Qaeda had good character?" But, but if I could have put the fear of death and the fear of being killed and the fear of all of this aside, you know, within the Quran it states that character is absolutely Im imperative. Lying, you know, like mutta kibr. Um, Liars, you know, this, this holds a very hot place in hell for you. And, and, and what I learned from Al-Qaeda was if I asked them a question and they did not want to give me the answer, they would not lie to me. They would just not give me the answer. They would just go quiet and say, we're not answering this. Rather than lying, obviously, because, you know, because this is, because, because this is haram. This is a big sin. And um, it taught me they would portray a big character, and, you know, good character. And I, and I was absolutely saturating myself in this for a number of years, if you like. And um, it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about sincerity and about not being flippant and about actually living for people and not living for money, you know, live for Jannah, don't live for, for dunya um, and, and live in the present and, and give thanks and be grateful. And it taught me these, these things. And I think it took me to a place, you know, this was a place where I always was as a child, but as you, as you grow up and you start to get into a career where you start to earn more money, you start to get too busy and distracted and you start to lose a track on life, or, you know, of what, of what really is important in life. And it allowed me to refocus on what matters. And I must say, when I came out the desert at the other end, it took me quite a long time. Or, I mean, up until now, you know, being three years out the desert, I don't like to be focused on money, you know, it, it, it doesn't give you value, it doesn't give you warmth, it doesn't give you a reason to wake up in the morning, really for everything is, is about purity and actually trying to help people and that, and that is probably one of the biggest things that I learned to grow as a person there in the desert, that we are all the same, you know, we've all been created, you know, by God and we are all the same, we all get hungry, we all get thirsty and we all want to actually, you know, create a better life. So it's important that there's a cart. It's important about these things. And that, that probably was the biggest lesson that I learned. I learned I must be a better person. I must be a better person for other people and for myself. Well, Stephen, we're going to go for a quick break. Uh, we need to pay a few bills. Uh, we'll be back with you. <laughs> All right. and explore wildlife at its natural best. It's where the pride of Africa comes together. The Quantu Private Game Reserve. Get to know the big five or cruise on an elephant safari game drive. Interact with lion and tiger cubs and enjoy world-class halal cuisine while we pamper you during your five-star stay. Indulge in the true African experience. For reservations, call now on 042-203-1400 or visit quantu.co.za. The Quantu Private Game Reserve, the place of gathering. As winter grips the Northern Hemisphere, refugees, IDPs and other vulnerable communities are doing all they can to survive. Winter is already the hardest time of year and in the current global context, this year could be even worse. With your help, the Al Imdad Foundation is delivering life-saving winter warmth items in 12 countries globally, including Syria, Palestine, Yemen, Kashmir and Pakistan. So be warm-hearted and sponsor a winter pack at just 600 Rand. Donate online at alimdad.com or call 0861-786-243 for more information. Dad, well, I've been chatting with an investment broker today and... Broker? Did the broker tell you that our economy is a mess? There's bushfires in Australia, America wanted World War III, and now the coronavirus is traveling around the world. Um... Uh... Well, I also thought about purchasing some crypto. Crypto? 
What's that? Like another pyramid scheme. I don't trust what I can't see. There's an apartment in Belisa. So all your family will be asking to stay there for free. And what if the government takes it away? Eh? Dad, I don't think it works like that. I'll tell you what works. Gold. At your age, I invested in gold coins and it paid for your university fees and your wedding. No contracts, no agreements. Your investment is in your hands and you own it. With a 70% growth in only five years, do you still doubt gold investment? Contact RJ Coin today. 031 202 Or visit them at 151 Stephen Lamini Road in Musgrave, Durban. Randery Jewelers Gold Coin Exchange, your passport to gold investment. Fabric Direct, now open at 224 Brickfield Road over Port Durban, offering you a variety of dress fabrics, curtaining, upholstery, wallpaper, and deco. Fabric Direct, quality, price, and a range that speaks for itself. 224 Brickfield Road over Port Durban. Fabric Direct, definitely worth a visit. Rejuvenating media day by day. This is Salam Media. The time is just gone uh, 9 uh, 36 a.m. We continue our discussion this morning with the longest held surviving Al Qaeda hostage, Stephen McGowan, uh, talking about his captivity for six years and also about his book. Uh, six years with Al-Qaeda and his reversion or conversion to Islam. Uh, Stephen, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Right. Now, one point that you make, and I think it's a very, very telling point, uh, where you speak about the greatest chess game of your life. And uh, obviously, you've made some major moves on the chess board. But one of the biggest moves you've made is uh, in terms of your revision, a reversion or conversion to Islam. And... Uh, if you think back in terms of what actually drew you to Islam and uh, your subsequent conversion, yeah, this was this was in early two thousand and twelve, and it was it was a very big decision. I mean, and I say this with with the utmost respect to absolutely everybody. You know, at the time at the time I was Christian, um, and and I was married to a Christian lady, and I was from a Christian household, and um, you know I was there in the desert, and and. Things were difficult. Things were incredibly difficult. I was never quite sure if I was going to be killed or not killed. And um, in the early days, I was very anxious about converting to Islam. I didn't understand Islam. I didn't understand, you know, the rules of Islam. I didn't understand what Islam entailed. I knew very little about Islam. Um, so what I did was, was, was in the early days, um, there was one other hostage with us. His name was Yahan, and he was he was adamant. He felt that that if he converted to Islam, this this could potentially save his life. Okay, so the conversions, the, the actual reasons for the conversions were not poor. Uh, sorry, 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 I, I'm pure. They, they weren't pure. They were, they, they were really to try and save one's life because, because you know, Al-Qaeda, they, 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 want, they want the entire world to be run by Islam. Okay, that is why they are fighting their battle. Um, and Yahan thought that potentially him converting to Islam would, would save his life. I converted a, um, a month after him. I was anxious. Um, I did not believe that that Al Qaeda would just come along and say, "Right, fantastic, Alhamdulillah, you've converted to Islam." Um, you know, I did not believe that they would just believe at face value that anybody was converting. It, it it just didn't make sense. Even though they were illiterate and quite a simple bunch of people, I did not believe that something like this would actually take place. So I spent a bit of while. You know, I spent some while in in the early days asking Al-Qaeda about Islam. What is it about? I wanted to make sure that, 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 that what I was doing was, was spiritually correct as well because when you've got a gun against your head and if they're going to pull the trigger within 20 seconds, you know, 19, 18, 17, and they're going to pull the trigger, I really did question, well, where am I going to go? Because now death becomes an absolute reality. What, am I going to go to Jannah? Am I going to go to Nar? What on earth is going to happen to me? And um, you know, obviously, dunya is is seventy years, and then you have akhirah, which is which is which is you know forever. And I did not want to spend the rest of my life there. You know, my, the rest of my of my afterlife sitting in Nar. So so I battled with this. I battled with the idea of converting because I wasn't sure what I was converting to. But it was in April 2012 that 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 things that got very strange there with Al Qaeda. And at this stage, I decided that 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 I needed to, I wanted to survive. I wanted to get home and I decided to go the same route as Yahan and, and, and convert. And I called one of the Mujahideen over and I said, I wanted to convert. And obviously you say, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And I went through the process and my life changed dramatically after that within the eyes of Al Qaeda. Um, from being a, a prisoner, 
I was still seen as a prisoner, but I was seen more as a brother, like a achi. So I was more of a brother. Apparently, they weren't allowed to kill me after this. I was not aware of this. Um, they mentioned it on occasions, but there was a lot of prisoner psychology. So it probably took two years after this for me to actually realize, you know, what had taken place. But my conversion allowed me many things. It certainly allowed me to, to learn Islam and to learn Arabic and to integrate with Al-Qaeda and get around a better understanding as to why they had me and what they wanted with me. Well, certainly. And you know what, Stephen, I think you and I can spend the better part of an hour actually talking uh, in detail and in depth. And uh, obviously, this led to you obviously coming back to uh, South Africa, but also uh, writing this book and uh, six years with Al-Qaeda, which is the title of the book. And uh, I know there has been an overwhelming demand for this book. And uh, I'm sure this book uh, details a lot. What are some of the standout issues in the book, uh, Stephen? You know, this book has far exceeded expectations, I must tell you. Even, even the publisher is, is, is delightedly surprised by the way we have been selling. We are battling to keep up with the, with the demand of this book. Um, it, it has been fantastic. It's been, it's been a crazy journey because, because the entire book has been written over Zoom. Um, I, didn't actually read my, um, I didn't actually meet my ghostwriter until about three days ago when he you know, you know, and like he was in Cape Town, so he flew up to Joburg, and I actually met him in person. So it's been a, it's been a crazy, a crazy experience, and I think there've been a, a lot of challenges for my ghostwriter, but it's been, it's been a wonderful experience, and it's certainly helped me with respect to trying to resettle in back to South Africa. You know, um, my family have been, my family have been interviewed. Um, my wife was interviewed. My dad was interviewed, um, and 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 I refer to the past six years as this as this big black hole because literally so much has changed in the last six years, and I've been trying to make sense of it. And really, sitting down and writing this book has been wonderful. There have been times of tears. Um, there have been times that have made me smile and laugh, but really, it's it's been opening up the door in my mind to actually allow me to understand and to force me to deal with certain things that I did experience there in the desert, which 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 possibly my mind has not want to revisit. But now writing this book has forced me to revisit it. So I suppose the book, I mean, the book really is is my story about about what took place and um, over the over the six years. But it's difficult to squeeze six years, you know, into into an interview. And um, we we have done an amazing job trying to squeeze my six years into this book. And the feedback's been amazing. Some of my some of my friends, one of my very good friends, actually, he told me that when I was in the desert, some of the most some of the most difficult times for him when I was in the desert was the days he didn't think about me, because those were the days that he realized that. You know, he was beginning to forget. I'd been gone for so long that he was be beginning to forget about the importance of our friendship. And now having come back to South Africa and now he's read the book, he told me that he thinks he maybe need to go and see, see somebody to talk about this because, because he's actually feeling a lot of guilt having read the book. He's, he's, he's revisited places in himself during, during times of those six years where, where he was battling and finding things difficult. And, and again, he's also um, feeling guilty about it because he says he feels like he should have done more. It's been it's affected so many people differently. I think I think the following in South Africa of my of my um, of my abduction was enormous, you know. And mm. I think this this crossed religions, it crossed it crossed cultures, it crossed colors, it crossed languages. Um, I believe I believe I believe the head imam in Cape Town used to pray for me in the mosque and ask for my release with with you know with the ummah with the congregation and and that absolutely blows me away i've i've met some amazing muslim guys in durban and they were helping me change attire and when they found out who i was you know alhamdulillah there was hugs and it and 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 they actually felt incredibly in a way angry saying that i got to learn islam through 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 al-qaeda's eyes and that and that is not the islam which which is which is the islam you know which we have here in south africa and it is, it is, you know, I've had, I've had African people cry on my shoulder. I've had white people cry on my shoulder. I've, it has brought absolutely everybody together. So I think this situation impacted more than just my family and I. It was my friends. It was the government. It was, it was the vast community, which, which leaves me in awe that there were so many amazing people following this and, and praying for me, doing dua for me while I was away. It, it, it blows my mind. Well, absolutely. And I think this is who we are as South Africans. And as you mentioned, you know, across all religious denominations, across all cultures. And uh, personally, for me, I must 
get my hands on your book and from what you've just described and obviously you've whet my appetite this morning Stephen and I'm sure many other people would like to get their hands on the book uh, where do they get or how do they get all of your book so the Daily Maverick are our publishers um, and I believe okay so 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 at the moment the CNA exclusive books you can buy it from those places um, otherwise directly from the Daily Maverick if you actually get onto their website well, certainly looking forward to that. And uh, I know, you, obviously, you've been uh, on speaking engagements as well uh, with many corporates uh, right uh, across the country. And I've also learned that possibly even Netflix has shown an interest uh, in filming your story. That is exciting. I, I, it's, it's a crazy story. I mean, six years is a, cra is a crazy long time. So if we can get onto Netflix, inshallah, it will be amazing. Well, well, Stephen, I must say it's been an absolute pleasure really having uh, this discussion with you this morning. And uh, we at Salam Media, we appreciate your time. You're taking time out and talking to us. It's just a pity to see the drive time show that, you know, we've had to rush through some of the issues. I'm sure there's a lot more that uh, you and I could be talking about, you know, in a more uh, in-depth or detailed discussion. But we value your time with us. Jazakallah to, to you so much. Jazakallah khair and shukran to you. Assalamu alaikum. Barakallah fiqh. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, it's uh, Stephen McGowan joining us this morning, and I must say, and uh, a fascinating interview this morning. And uh, it's just a pity that uh, because uh, of time limitations, we couldn't engage a lot more. But yes, you can get hold of his book, and uh, it is called uh, Six Years with Al Qaeda, the Stephen McGowan story. And you can get it in the CNA exclusive books and uh, the Daily Maverick which is publishing this book. And I'm sure there is just so much that uh, Stephen, in terms of his uh, experiences and uh, a lot more in terms of in-depth understanding as to what he had gone through in the six years in captivity. With that, uh, we're going for a break. We come back and we'll be joined by Farah Nabulsi.